have cracked and we'll discuss about that. So the topic which I'm going to discuss today is the strengthening mechanisms.
So then they will go and they will start living at one place and they will form very small clusters, nano sized clusters. Okay? They will not have a definition of any new entity. They still belong to the same matrix with the same crystal structure. Okay? So for example, in, in aluminum copper alloy, copper will go and sit at some specific locations of MCC crystal which is formed by aluminum. Okay? And more and more copper will start sitting them sitting on those planes. And then they will form what is known as GP zones. Okay? So GP zones are crisp, not, not really precipitates, they are clusters. They are crisp, clusters of copper atoms. And then once there are too many like atoms at one place, then why not make a new family? So they start with a common plane of the matrix and they start building a new building from a common <coughs> wall. Okay? So you have another building, a lot of buildings are there and you have a lot of common walls. So from that common wall, the new copper atom or those who have clustered together, they will start making new, a new system and that is called habit plane. Okay? And then they will start making a precipitate and initially the precipitate is coherent in nature. Okay? So coherent meaning that the crystal structure of this precipitate and the matrix is same, but the lattice parameter is not. So in the matrix you have aluminum, 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 and in the precipitate you have copper, or a different stoichiometry of aluminum and copper. Suppose three atoms of aluminum and one atom of copper, this combination is there in this, and they form FCC only, but that FCC will have a different lattice parameter than the precipitate. Okay? Do you understand? Okay? So what can happen here? A dislocation can pass through this precipitate. As long as the precipitate is coherent, a dislocation will find a plane although the stress required for the dislocation to move will increase because the lattice parameter is different. So atoms are either more closely packed or less closely. So the amount of distortion will also be too much. If you place an extra half plane when the atoms are closely living or sitting together then that distortion will be too high in comparison to atoms which are Sitting apart, right? So this is an extra half plane, and atoms are at this location. So you have this kind of distortion, right? If these atoms are sitting very close, suppose here, then this distortion will be more than that. So in order to move this, you will need more stress. So per Navarro stress will increase and that's why per Navarro stress is a function of the interatomic distance and interplanar distance. Okay? So after a while, when you have moderate temperature or sufficient amount of temperature, so that more carbon, sorry, copper atoms can join, then this coherent precipitate will now try to now it is in the transition of making its own crystal structure. Okay? So it is now changing gradually and you will have a phase where the precipitate is not fully coherent. It is semi-coherent. Okay? So when it is trying to make one-on-one -on -one atomic layer with the precipitate and matrix, that is asking the precipitate to distort a lot. Right? So this zone is highly distorted. So you have a lot of what is known as coherency strain. Okay? In order to have coherence, there is a lot of deformation. That much strain must be accommodated. Okay? When this precipitate loses some coherency, so some of 
the layers are continuous, but some of them are not. Some of them do not have a continuation. Then the strain will decrease. So you don't need to really have one-on-one -on -one correlation. So you will have less coherency strain. So in, in that perspective, precipitate is a little bit happier. So those copper atoms are not heavily distorted, right? So that is a semi-coherent interface and semi-coherent precipitate and how that can happen. So this layer is missing. So you have actually a dislocation here. This dislocation has been created because of some coherency which has been broken, right? So some atomic layers which had a continuation, now that is gone. The copper atoms have shifted their atomic layer in the precipitate, so this continuation is now missing. And this is not happening abruptly. Okay? So you will have a lot of dislocations arising at the interface of the precipitate when this precipitate becomes semi coherent And the end type of coherent when you, sorry, end, end point of a precipitate is incoherent precipitate. When you have no continuation from the matrix to the precipitate. So you really have no, no continuation. So this forms a different crystal structure altogether. So now it's a different crystal structure. Matrix is a different crystal structure. There is no coherence. Okay? So there is a clear interface there. So now there is a boundary where dislocation will pile up and will not be able to go. Okay? So if precipitates are coherent, dislocation can pass through it. If dislocations are, sorry, if the precipitate is semi-coherent, some of them can still pass through. If it is incoherent, it cannot pass through, it will drop. So which one is good? Which type of precipitate you will like to have in your system so that maximum amount of resistance can be offered to the dislocation? Not really. Not really. So you have to think a lot of things. When there are precipitates, where are these precipitates coming from? They are coming from the matrix. Right? You have solidified it. The system had whatever amount of copper you mix, that much amount of copper you have, you can't increase it or decrease it. So that amount is fixed. If you put 4% copper, you are not going to increase it. So that amount is there. <coughs> so now suppose you, you introduce a lot of nucleation sites for the precipitates by increasing the grain size. Sorry, grain <coughs> boundary. So decreasing the grain size. Okay? So you have given a lot of so if your grain size is whatever, then all <coughs> these boundaries they have possibility of nucleation of new precipitates. Okay? So suppose you have suppose in one case you have more number of nucleation of these precipitates. <coughs> and another case is that you form incoherent. So when you have incoherent precipitate, that is a result of long-term diffusion and a lot of copper has come at one place, right? So number of precipitates will decrease. If you have too many coherent precipitates, which are of smaller sizes, then you will have more number of precipitates, but the size will be small and they will not be, they will not be clean. Okay. Once they become incoherent, they will diffuse and one will grow at the cost of another one and the total number will decrease because the amount is limited. Right? So you can't really say that which one is better. If you have 100 numbers of coherent precipitate, they will also increase the strength. And they will increase the strength more in comparison to if you have only 20 incoherent Okay? Because not many dislocations will be blocked by that. Too many dislocations will have higher stress needed to pass through these coherent precipitates 
However, only less number of dislocations will really be blocked by these precipitates. And if cross-slip is possible, they will cross-slip and move on. Okay? So strength of metallic materials can be increased by various ways. Tell me those ways. Tell me some, some ways of increasing the strength of material. Reducing the grain size. Yes. Then? Solid solution system. Solid solution. Grain boundary. Then? Is there anything else? Precipitation hardening. Precipitation hardening. Dispersion hardening. What else? <coughs> and all of these mechanisms are so all of these mechanisms are related to movement of this one. Because that's how plasticity is happening. Okay? So precipitation hardening and dispersion hardening, that's the difference. So as you said, that incoherent crystal stuff. Right? So these incoherent precipitates, you said that if you have, then they will offer more resistance to the material, right? Right? But if I have limited amount of the material in the system, I cannot make more number of incoherent precipitates. There is another way of doing it. Another way is, let us put some incoherent particles in the matrix and then solidify so that I have those incoherent things already and I have more number of it. So I can really, really uh, decide how much amount of these incoherent precipitates I will have. And that is called dispersion. So you put, deliberately you put some oxides in the steel or in metallic materials and they will not melt because oxide has higher melting point. Okay? And then when you make the new, so when you solidify it, you have a lot of those oxides which have a completely different crystal structure and they are going to block the dislocations and you have more number of them. Okay? So you can get some examples and those are called oxide dispersion strengthened alloys. ODS alloy. And uh, in steels like uh, nitrome one moly, modified nitrome one moly, and cousins of this steel, and other steels, you put oxides of yttria in a very fine side so that the strength increases. Okay? You can also, and, and this oxide is also put in zirconia, which is a ceramic, and there the advantage is not that the strength of the material will, will increase. When yttria is put in zirconia, then there is a different mechanism which works to increase the fracture toughness of ceramic, but not the strength. Okay? So that we will see when we talk about intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms of improvement of plastic toughness. Okay. So solid solution hardening or solid solution strengthening can be because of various reasons. And solid solution strengthening is putting different atoms. So for example, in iron, if you put a equivalent sized atom, which is which has an atomic size closer to iron, like chromium tungsten, niobium, tantalum, vanadium, and all those things, then those are substitutional atoms. Why? Because they will be substituting iron from their sides. Right? So if I have 90% iron and 10% chromium or 10% manganese, then those 10% are going to sit at the atomic sites where iron should have been if iron was 100%. And 
interstitials will not be sitting at these atomic sites. So solid solution strengthening has a contribution <coughs> by both interstitials and substitution. We have seen one mechanism. These atoms can join the dislocation and block them, pin them. Okay? That mechanism we have discussed. I don't know if you remember or not. Looks like no. <coughs> but there are different ways by which they can increase the strength. One is elastic interaction. Then you can have modulus interaction. Then you can have electric interaction. Then you can have stacking fault or anti-phase boundary interaction. So there are various ways by which the, the foreign atom can increase the strength of the material. Okay? So in a crystal, if instead of iron, I put a bigger atom of tungsten, which is not equal to iron, it's bigger than iron. Okay? So it is, it will try to compress the other two atoms sitting at this end to it. Right? So it will cause a compressive elastic stress field on the neighboring atoms. This is elastic interaction. Okay? Then now suppose you have a crystal and in that crystal you have aluminum and then you have copper sitting at the face. Okay? So if it was pure aluminum, then in this direction you will have some stiffness. Right? So two aluminum will have a bond strength and when you stretch it in tension or compression, you will get that type of stiffness in that direction. That's why we have 81 components of stiffness tensor. <coughs> so, if it was aluminum, there would have been a different stretching. So suppose this is a spring. And if I apply a force, there is going to be a displacement which is proportional to, so proportionality constant is the spring constant in this case. Right? So this spring constant is equivalent to the bond strength we have between two atoms, right? So if it was aluminum, aluminum, you will have K1. If there is copper now, this is going to offer a different resistance. So this is going to have a different modulus in this direction. It will not be equal to the Young's modulus of pure aluminum. Okay? So this is called modulus interaction. Okay? Then in some ionic crystals, you can have dislocations which have charges associated to the two ends of the dislocation. This will not happen in metallic materials. Okay? And there you can have defects like Schottky and Frankel defects. And some ionized atom can sit and they can discharge or charge a dislocation abnormally and that will cause a dislocation to either. So for example, one end of the dislocation is positively charged and a negatively charged atom goes and sits there. For example, in NaCl, Cl goes and sits there and it will decrease the net charge of the dipoles of the dislocation and the dislocation will have a happy situation not to move. It is similar to pinning the dislocation in metallic materials by interstitial. That is your electric interaction. Okay? We know that dislocations, they dissociate into partials, Schottky partials. A perfect dislocation can dissociate into Schottky partial and when it dissociates into Schottky partial, it creates a stacking form. Okay? So suppose these two are the partial dislocation of type this. And the space between them is distorted and that is your stacking fault. This stacking fault is a surface defect because there is a surface which has been created. And this surface requires an energy that is called a stacking fault energy. If this energy is high, 
stacking fault will form. Okay? And if the energy is high, there is a stacking fault possibility of stacking fault formation, then dislocation will have more tendency to dissociate. If they can dissociate, they can easily move. Right? Because that's why they are dissociated. Because energetically that path is more easy for the dislocation to go to the next step. Right? So that means if stacking fault is high, stacking fault energy is high, you will have lower strength in the material. If stacking fault energy is less, you will have higher strength because dislocation will not be able to dissociate, they will not be able to move. Okay? So that is the stacking fault interaction. And similar, although explaining it is a little complicated, but you can just replace the stacking fault with anti phase boundary and the remaining story remains the same. Okay? So that is also uh, a place where atoms are not in phase. So you have an orientation mismatch. Okay? Along the boundary, which is called anti phase boundary. And this boundary has its own energy like brain boundary. And it is going to, if the anti phase boundary has sufficient amount of energy, then a dislocation will not be able to cross that boundary. And that will cause more strengthening. All of these are related to solid solution strengthening. All of these are parts of solid solution strengthening. Okay? So now. Sir, stacking fault energy depend on the stack size? Mm, no. Any relation with stacking, of the stack? No. Stacking fault energy is that if you have a stacking of ABC, ABC. Yes, sir. Okay. And how will I make the stacking fault if this layer is removed? Yeah. Okay. So if this layer is removed, then how much energy is needed so that they can sit properly and don't move? Okay. So that is the stacking fault. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, now let us come to brain boundary and there is nothing new there. We know that brain boundary, if we increase, it will increase the strength of the material. Okay? What's the time? Okay. So, So we know that shear stress on a dislocation can be written as Gb by d phi r. Okay. And for length of L, if there are n number of dislocations which has phi left, this n is the number of this location, then I can replace R with L by N. Right? So, then I can write N as N is equal to how much? So then this N will come above. Right? So this will be 2 pi now S L divided by G. Right? So, for certain number of dislocations to get piled up at grain boundary, you need certain amount of strength, certain amount of shear stress. Right? And this constant might be different. It might not be two. It might be because this is for screw dislocation. Gb by 2 pi r is for screw dislocation. Okay? So we can replace this with a number k. <laughs> Some constant into this. We'll define how many number of dislocations can pile up to a gain power. Right? Now, what do I want to do is that if there are n number of dislocations which have piled up on, a, on an obstacle, then the amount of stress which I need to break that barrier will be n times the shear stress 
which each dislocation is facing. Okay? And this shear stress will be the amount of shear stress which has been applied minus the amount of stress which the dislocation is offering as a resistance. So internal friction. Okay? It is not really that physics friction, it's the friction which is coming. So in terms of pearl and barrel stress, dislocation width and all those things. How much is the interplanar spacing? What size of atoms are there and things like that will define what is the internal stress. Okay? Friction also. So then I can write the critical stress needed to break it is equal to so what is that? N is k pi tau s into tau s will be tau s squared L divided by G B. This is N tau s and then I can replace tau s with this. So this is tau minus tau i whole square. Right? Is it okay? Now I want to know how much stress is the applied stress. How much stress I need to apply. So then I need to find out what is the value of tau. Can we find that? So tau minus tau i whole square will be gb tau c divided by k pi l. Right? Is there anything missing? No, no. No, sir. And then square root of that will be equal to this. So the applied shear stress will be this plus tau i. <coughs> now this length, which is there, where the number of dislocations can pile up, it will be very fair if I imagine this to be the diameter or the radius of the grain. Okay? Because the maximum distance where a dislocation can go towards the boundary will be the center of the grain. Right? So from here a dislocation goes to the boundary. So how many number of dislocation I can have? I can get that if I replace L with D by 2. Right? So I can replace L with D and then 2 will come here. So this I can write as tau is equal to tau i plus some blah 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 d to the power minus half where d is the grain size, grain diameter and what is this equation? Yes. 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 So this is all all relation which was extended by fetch so all fetch relation which says that if you increase the grain size your strength will decrease ok so with this you can and how do you find out the value of alpha and tau how do you find out so these are theoretical things how do you find out the value of internal stress and how do you find out alpha how do you do it? It's very simple. You find out the yield strength for different grain sizes and plot it. Yeah? And if you plot d to the power minus half and tau, which is your yield strength in uni axial loading. Then you will get a straight line because this is replaced by x. So the slope of the straight line will be alpha and the intercept will be related with tau y. Okay? And there are American standards which says how to define this grain diameter d. So that I am not going to discuss. They have different numbers. If the ASTM grain size number is n k, then d is root over 6 by n. There are some 
or a modified relation also. So what is NA? NA is a number which is given by ASTM. How does that get? So they have charts of different grain sizes and you compare with your microstructure and see it is looking here by this chart or that grain size and then you say that, okay, so this is ASTM grain size number 5 or 6 or 8 or 0 or 32. And they are inversely related. So if ASTM grain size number is high, that means grain diameter is very small. Okay? So just keep informing me about the time because I don't know. Four fifty five. Okay. Last five. So what other mechanism is left? I don't think anything is left. Or Precipitation hardening we have discussed, grain boundary hardening we have discussed, strain hardening we have discussed, strain hardening is also so this location and this location and there are some dark grain formation. <coughs> and that's it. So strengthening mechanism is done. Okay. So from the next week we will go, we will start with Griffith's theory. Of fracture mechanics, which is pretty simple. We need to George Urban. George Urban will take some time. And then we will go to Rice. That will take a lot of time. Then we will talk about fractography, fractal dimensions, quantitative fractography. We will also talk about damage, continuum damage mechanics, and how we define damage. Okay.